when it comes to our modern scientific understanding of physical reality, touch, taste, see, physical reality, there is one man who changed everything. As one commentator put it, one of those once-in-a-century geniuses who perceived the physical world with sharper senses than those around him. Now, some of you might think that I'm speaking about Albert Einstein, um, who obviously, it's hard to argue against his impact. Uh, many times we don't sense that, but we live in it every single day from the little device you have in your pocket to all sorts of other things would not be possible without somebody like Einstein. But listen to this. I'm not speaking about Einstein. It was this man who introduced the system of thought experiments that Einstein would later use. When someone suggested to Einstein that he had done great things because he stood on Isaac Newton's shoulders, Einstein replied, no, I don't. I stand on the shoulders of Maxwell. I know, I know what you're thinking. You're going, wait, who? Maxwell? James Clerk Maxwell is not a name most people are familiar with, but as one of his biographers described it, in the 19th century, he made fundamental contributions to every aspect of physical science. Foundational. Every aspect of physical science. Discoveries that went on in one way or another to shape the entire 20th century. For example, by discovering the nature of electromagnetic waves, he made possible the development of our great communication networks, television, radio, radar, mobile phone, cellular. And the list with this guy could go on and on and on. One man. And that's just one example. In so many different areas, from art to sports, from politics to philosophy, there have been key individuals whose contributions radically changed not only their field of study or their area of influence, but in time, the whole world as well. And yet, there is one man whose impact simply cannot be rivaled. Let's talk about him this morning as we look at Romans 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. Now, as I read through these verses, think about that idea of, of how one man changed everything. These verses kind of sit at the end of a Really, the first part of Romans. We're kind of coming to a conclusion here of sorts. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. And Paul writes this in verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin, indeed, was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted, reckoned, noted why, where there is no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses. That's before the law of Moses, of course. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who sinning, there's sin still in the world, sinning was not like the tra transgression of Adam. That is a violation of a direct or explicit command. Their sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many die through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abound for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. 
for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification or acquittal. For if, one, for if because of one man's trespass, death reign through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness, much more will they reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now, the law, the law came to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Did you see him? Did you identify him here in the text? The one man who changed everything? Did you see him? Well, hopefully you noticed that according to Paul, there wasn't simply one man who changed everything. There were two. There were two. One men. <laughs> one man, one men, two. There were two. It's hard to miss the fact that Paul uses this phrase, one man, nine times in ten verses. But again, he uses that phrase, one man, to refer to two different individuals. The first one man is the first man. The first man. Verse 14, Adam. The second one man is, verse 15, Jesus Christ. And as I'm sure you noticed in this passage, Paul is using here something like a compare and contrast approach with these two men in order to encourage his readers in light of God's amazing work of redemption. Now, there is absolutely no way that we have time this morning to really unpack verses as theologically dense as these. So instead, we'll do our best to think about the passage as a whole, look at some of those details, but thinking as a whole, and really how does it fit into the flow of Paul's thinking in this letter? Where is he at in his argument? How did he arrive at this point? How is he trying to either restate or sum up what he's already said. So how does it fit into the flow of Paul's thinking in this letter to the disciples of Jesus in the city of Rome? Of course, to do that well, we need to understand how Paul's thinking has been flowing thus far. Where have we come from? And an easy way to do that is just to simply summarize the major sections up to this point. A lot of times we don't get this detailed on a Sunday morning in our study, but I just want to give you, let's pop up a first one here, just give you kind of a basic point to show you. We're just going to run through these real quick to give you a sense of the structure of the book. And hopefully I'm, in doing that, I'm equipping you more as you read Scripture to try to think about those parts. What am I reading? How do they break down? Where has the writer come from? So notice this. First half of chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, is clearly focused on the gospel as the power of God for salvation to everyone. Emphasize, underline, italicize everyone who believes, both Jew and non Jew, that is, the Gentiles. Take a look from 118 to chapter 3, verse 20. Paul 
expertly establishes that both Jew and Gentile, that's everyone from chapter 1, everyone is guilty before God. All of us are guilty before God, and thus, this is evidence of our desperate need. This is confirmation of our desperate need for this gospel deliverance mentioned in chapter 1. The gospel is salvation. We need this salvation. Paul lays that out in 118 through 320. Then comes the central passage of the whole book. If you didn't catch it, you need to go back and reread it again. This is the main passage. These are the verses that make sense of all Romans. You can't skip over them. You can't minimize them. You can't brush past them. This is key. Verses 21 through 31 of chapter 3. That's it. That's the heartbeat of Romans right there. This comes to that central passage which makes this good news explicit. How can we, as guilty sinners, be delivered from the judgment we deserve and restored to our Creator by His grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? Go back and read 321 through 31 and you'll see exactly what I'm saying. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Chapter 4 simply shows us how this kind of saving faith is not a new thing. It's not new fandangled kind of thing that Paul's inventing. It actually goes all the way back to Abraham. All the way back to Abraham before the law of Moses. Now, the first half of chapter 5, when we get there, emphasizes how this peace with God through Jesus is all of God. It's all of God, given while we were still sinners and sure to hold firm to the end no matter what. Right? If He saved us now while we were His enemies, how much more will He deliver us from the wrath of God that is to come? All of God. So that's a quick little rundown, as you see right there, of the first part of the book. All built around what? You see it? The Gospel right the gospel <laughs> everything is there about it's about gospel how do how do all of them end salvation for salvation so that's our key theme so what you may have detected in your readings in romans and if you didn't go back and kind of think through and read through that, that book again as as elder christian was encouraging us to do but go back and think about this fact. You may have picked it up here or in my summary of this overview. In large part, this letter is not just kind of a general unpacking of Paul's gospel. This is a very carefully crafted explanation of Paul's gospel that he was preaching for his Jewish Christian readers. The church in Rome appears to have been dominated by Jewish believers, Jewish Christians. And they had some concerns. Based on what we're seeing in this book, we can deduce that there were some real concerns in that church that Paul was trying to kind of confront, uh, 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 deal with, answer, questions to answer. Not only did they seem to be leery of his ministry among the Gentiles, Paul, an apostle to the Gentiles. They were leery about that, but related to that idea, they were unsure about his commitment to the law of Moses as distinctive for Jewish identity and as a system to maintain moral order. Guardrails against sin. So as Romans indicates, Paul wants them to understand that this gospel saves all people. Jew and Gentile. And that it does so apart from the law. If you walk away with just two things this morning about the book of Romans, take those. Jewish Christian audience, he's saying this is for all people and salvation comes apart from the law. As Paul has just explained, we are justified. That is, we are acquitted before the high court of heaven. We are acquitted before God by His grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. 
And so to summarize, in this section we're looking at this morning, verses 12 through 21, what he's doing here is summarizing and driving home the scope of his gospel as he concludes the first section of this book. And he does that through 5, 12 through 21. So what exactly does this passage, our main passage, tell us about the scope of the gospel? It reveals here in big, broad brushstrokes how human history and humanity itself are now divided into two distinct kingdoms. Two kingdoms. Over one kingdom, Paul says, death reigns. Over the other kingdom, grace reigns, leading to eternal life. And each of these kingdoms is connected to the beginning of an an era or an age defined by the actions of one man. You see the parallel there? Right? A new era, a, a, a distinct eras, they both are defined by the actions of one man. If we were to visualize the parallels here, you'll see it. If we were to visualize those parallels that Paul is outlining here, it might look like this. There is one man, Adam, who was a sinner and disobedient. That brought condemnation, making us sinners resulting in death. But there was a second man, one man, Jesus, who was righteous and obedient. He brought justification or acquittal making us righteous, resulting in life, eternal life. You see that? This is just to simplify that very dense section we just read through. These are the main ideas. So the one man, Adam, changed everything by introducing sin into the world, verse 12. But the one man, Jesus, verse 17, brought an abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness. Thankfully, as Paul writes in verse 15, the free gift is not like the trespass. Praise God for that. It's not like the trespass in so many ways. So as we just saw in those parallels, the key words here are condemnation and death for those under Adam, but justification and life for those under Jesus. Two kingdoms. Adam was the one man who changed everything. But brothers and sisters, Jesus alone is the one man who changed everything for the better. Amen? For the better. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the implications of a passage like this for our lives, for your life. Consider how these ideas should radically affect your perspective. I know there's a lot in these verses, and they do deserve your time and attention of just going back and trying to unpack and understand them. But I would encourage you, think about broadly how this picture window into reality, divine reality, reality in all of its fullness, should radically affect our perspective and then our practice. For example, think about this point. Mankind will never get better on its own. Mankind will never get better on its own. You may not know this, but God's Word never really explains how our sin sickness, Jeremiah 17, are desperately, right? We're desperately sick. We're desperately sick. How that sin sickness, sometimes called in church history, original sin, God's Word never really explains how it was or is passed down to us from our first parents. We just don't know. It doesn't go into that. right? Is it in our cells? Well, no. <laughs> it's like not in our cells. You can't see it under a microscope. Like some little thing floating around in there. That <laughs> It's the sin contagion. It does not really explain this. But we do know from Scripture, verse 12 tells us sin came into the world through Adam. 
Adam opened a door that was not shut and will not be shut until the end when Christ brings consummation. But sin came into the world through Adam, but the consequence, that consequence of spiritual death, then physical, then eternal death, but spiritual death primarily, right? First begin with, that consequence of spiritual death being talked about here is experienced well beyond our first father because it says right here, death spread to all men because all sin. Death spread to all men because all sin. That is, we are headed for a trajectory of death because we are sinners and we will be judged as the passage is made clear. Every single human being now living, that's 7.8 billion or 7.88 billion, and every human being who has ever lived on this planet has been infected and is willful in that sickness. Both. We are infected and we are willful. And if we are not under Jesus, we are still under Adam. Two kingdoms, that's it. Two kingdoms. Everyone you know. Two kingdoms. One or the other. Nothing else. That means that though certain features of human existence can improve and have improved. So, even though certain features of human existence can improve and have improved, we simply cannot as God's people put our ultimate trust in some idea, some movement, some strategy, some initiative that's built on the belief that people will get kinder and smarter and wiser and less selfish. We cannot believe that. We will not be duped in that way, will we? Jesus knew the heart of man that they were evil, therefore he would not entrust himself to them. John chapter 2. 2 Corinthians 1, we are not ignorant of the strategies of Satan the tactics that he often uses. He can even appear as an angel of, of light, can't he? Only Jesus Christ can undo Adam. Amen? Only Jesus can undo Adam. So brothers and sisters, beware of the subtle ways we can be deceived by people who believe otherwise. Very subtle ways. Be on guard Pray for vigilance and discernment in that. Second, number two, the gospel is good news for all people. It seems that the Jews to whom Paul wrote, many of them in this letter, many of the Jews to whom he wrote were forgetting that David, Moses, and Abraham all point us back to Adam. They were stuck kind of in the middle of the, of the Old Testament, <laughs> somewhere in that area, maybe going back to Genesis and, and Abraham. They weren't going back to Adam. That is, Jesus was not simply the Messiah of Israel. He was ultimately the Savior of the world. Praise God. The Savior of all mankind. Every family of the earth will be blessed. Throughout this passage, Paul refers over and over again to all, to all men, to the many. Paul's mission to the Gentiles was grounded in Jesus Christ's mission to reverse the curse of Adam. That's what his readers needed to understand. They were hung up in all these technicalities and such an isolated, narrow view of themselves as God's people. They weren't seeing the scope, the vast extent of everything that Jesus was doing in reversing the curse worldwide, universally, globally for all peoples. Like those first readers, we also need to guard our hearts, brothers and sisters. We need to guard our hearts that we don't slip into this mindset of only being concerned spiritually with people like us. However you want to define people like us, we can become too focused, brothers and sisters. Above all, 
our priority must be seeing the way in which we are all similar because of Adam, not different for any other reason. That we say, there's someone who's a daughter of Adam. There's someone who's a son of Adam. They come from Adam like me. Are they under the reign of death still? Or are they under the reign of grace? When that becomes the primary lens through which we look at others, then I believe like Paul, we will be drawn back to mission. We will be drawn back to burden. We will be drawn back in light of the one man, Jesus. Rather than, oh, Jesus is reaching the Gentiles, suspicion is the first feeling. Not praise. Suspicion. Shouldn't be so. Like Jesus, we should have that heart. Like Paul, to say, aren't you rejoicing in the fact that the light is shining on the Gentiles? The Gospel is good news for all people. That means it's good news for every person in your life. Every person. Even the person you see on the TV who's being railed against. Even the person that just moved in down the street that looks kind of weird that you don't know. Even the person, right, that you had a falling out with or never really liked their family or whatever it was. The gospel is for all people. Amen? All people. Finally, number three, eternal life results from receiving, not doing. Eternal life results from receiving, not doing. It appears some of the Jewish Christians in Rome were struggling. They were confused about the role of the law in terms of righteousness and eternal life. As I've already emphasized, Paul makes it crystal clear in this passage that our only hope in light of Adam's disobedience and the reign of death is what Jesus did, not anything we can do. That's what we see here. What Jesus did, not anything we can do. Five times Paul speaks about God's grace in this passage five times he writes about god's free gift that's a total of 10 times that's more than he's mentioned the one man those two words put together free gift and grace that are so closely aligned in this passage and throughout paul's writings free gift and grace brothers and sisters friends that is good news here is good news a gift is not and cannot cannot be earned a gift is simply received how amazing is the statement in the second half of verse 16 look at there again for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification did you catch that Did you catch that? Adam's trespass was followed by what? Judgment. But many trespasses, our many trespasses, were followed by what? A free gift. You would think as the trespass count went up, (laughs) <laughs> the judgment the judgment would become like more pervasive right or even more like locked in cemented that there's judgment coming no no even though maybe some in rome were really in a judgmental mindset no it was followed by the free gift verse 17 the abundance of grace God's abundance of grace. And what is this free gift? We might just think it's just grace. Well, not exactly. He actually defines what the free gift is. Do you see it there in verse 17? What is the free gift that we're talking about? Kedrick had it. Righteousness. It's a free gift of righteousness. (gasps) That solves the entire dilemma. That what was, was meant to get these Jewish Christians going, oh, okay, wait a minute, I see now. You can't not have righteousness if you're going to be at peace with God. Do you understand that, brothers and sisters? You cannot be right before God. You cannot stand before God. You cannot be in fellowship with God. 
You cannot have peace with God unless you have righteousness. Why? Because God is a righteous God. Pure. Light. Right? The light. No darkness at all. Zero. You need righteousness. Are you going to establish that on your own? Never. Never ever will you establish any kind of righteousness on your own. You are not good enough. I am not good enough. We never will be as sinners. Ever. Doesn't matter if you have the law. Paul told his Jewish readers, doesn't matter if you have the law. The law has advantages, but you need, to know, you, know, you need to know the reason God gave it and how it functions. Because if you did, you understand that it's pointing you to a righteousness that we call, or the, theologians call, an alien righteousness. Oh, it sounds crazy, right? Flying saucers, UFOs, no, not that. It means from outside of you. Right? Outside of you, God's giving you a righteousness. He's just giving it to you as a gift, free for you to take. This is the only reason you have a relationship with God. You have got to rejoice in this. You have got to shake off those scales. You've got to pray and say, God, give me a vision to see this righteousness, this alien righteousness, this imputed righteousness as it's called given written into my book written into my account why because i deserved it why because i'm so lovely no the sheer grace of god mercy compassion an abundance of grace even what did we deserve many trespasses judgment condemnation death that's our family that's adam that's where we come from that's on our family crest, right? We deserve judgment and death. We're sinners. Paul says this is glorious. This is much bigger. This is huge. You and I as children of Adam, the sinner, how can we be acquitted, declared innocent of all charges before God with a righteousness, a right standing before God that comes as a gift from God through faith alone in Christ alone. Here's my question. Are you resting in that grace this morning? Are you resting in that grace this morning? Now, my privileged position as your pastor, as one of your pastors, I can tell you right now, I know a lot of you are not at rest. You're not resting. There is some form of works righteousness happening right now inside of you. And it's some, of, for some of you, it's been there a long time and you've disguised it and you've baptized it with a lot of Christian terminology. Or, you, or it's been distorted and skewed by trauma in your life. And uh, you tell yourself you have to do these things, you have to be a certain way. right? If you don't, it's not safe for you. Tell yourself that over and over again. Are you resting in this grace this morning? Because that's what God wants you to do. The first verse of this chapter is what? Therefore, since we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. Peace. You're not resting, are you? He wants you to really rest. The one man who changed everything for the better, can change and continue to change our distortions about doing. We're classic distorters when it comes to doing, aren't we? We've got a default of distortion when it comes to doing. Distortions that we know always lead to either pride or hopelessness. We're either, picking, we're either lifting ourselves up, exalting ourselves, or we're beating ourselves up. That's where these distortions lead. Paul has important things to tell us about doing. He does. He wants to talk to us about doing. In the next three chapters, he will. 6, 7, and 8. Then he'll pick it up again. 12, 13, 14. He will talk to us about doing. How glorious it is. How wonderful it is. How important doing is. But it has to be put in the right order. 
It has to be put in its proper place. The first thing that we need to do is stand in awe of the fact that though we were born in Adam, we can be born again in Jesus. That's what we need to rejoice over and be glad for so that we can know this rest. We can experience this rest. Brothers and sisters, friends, receive then this rest. Receive and then rest. Receive in faith. Come under the reign of grace. Doesn't that sound much better? The reign of grace. Then walk in that grace. Rejoice in such incredible love as the curtain has been pulled back this morning. We have seen such incredible love. Rejoice in the stunning extent of what Christ has accomplished. And may this vision here in Romans 5, 12-21 May this vision of human history and divine grace powerfully influence your thinking at all times as you think about yourself, you think about and you think about those around you. This is how Paul wanted his readers to see. He said, Your focus is too narrow. You need to see all that Christ has done that we see everything, including our own story, through this beautiful vision of human history and divine grace. Pray with me, brothers and sisters.